Apologies for here. Apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. Um, welcome and thanks for joining our quantitative seminar. My name is Lichi. I'm helping out with uh, organizing the series for this quarter uh, with the Branch Lab. So let me begin with a land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all bands and tribes in the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Um, the lab also acknowledges that we live and work on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. And so to start um, introducing our three speakers today, um, we have Cole Monahan, who is a Corm graduate and now works at, at the Alaska Center as an assessment scientist. We've got Megzi Seifel, who got her PhD at SAS in 2017 and did a postdoc in the OSHA Modeling Forum with Andre Punt working on marine mammal bycatch. She was also a James S. McDonald postdoc fellow at UC Santa Barbara. She now works at the Groundfish Assessment Program at the Alaska Center, where her research focuses on accounting for ecosystem processes in how we assess fish and invertebrate distributions. She has been talking about writing a paper with Cole for approximately 10 years, and now they're finally working on one. <laughs> Uh, and Jason Connor has worked at NOAA since 1997, uh, beginning on the East Coast with the Marine Mammal Stranding Program and shifting to design coastwide fisheries reporting systems before moving west. For the past 20 years, he has conducted groundfish surveys in Alaska. His current areas of study are the accuracy and precision of design and model-based survey abundance estimates. And so today we'll hear them talk about this. Take it away. So the mic's on the laptop? The mic is on the laptop. Okay. So repeat. And, oh, yeah. And they'll take questions during the presentation. Um, and when you hear and, questions, try to repeat them. Yes. So okay. We ready? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Li Chi. Thanks for coming, everybody, and everyone online. Hopefully, this goes smoothly. Um, yeah. So before I, we jump into the details, just a little bit of background and context here. Um, so Megzi and I were working on this project looking at kind of log normality and in, 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 um, of indices and stock assessments. And we're kind of kind of floundering a little bit, trying some things. It wasn't working that great. And then we heard kind of coincidentally that Jason, who's also just down the hall, was working with Jim Thorson on this new distribution that was, um, was working quite well. Um, and it turned out, so I went to him and it turned out to be the perfect tool for our study as well. And so they're, they're kind of linked in that way. And so we thought we would just kind of merge these two together. So it's kind of two separate topics that are um, related in the same umbrella. So I'll just kind of introduce the, the ideas. Jason's going to talk about this new distribution, the generalized gamma, and its application in VAST. Um, Megzi's going to go through some bootstrapping um, methods and results, and then I'll talk about implications for stock assessments um, at the end. So yeah, let's jump in. So just so we're all on the same page, um, we're going to talk a lot about log normality today. So just to define it, right, so if we have some um, random variable x, it's normal. If we exponentiate that, then y is said to be log normal. Or in other words, if you log it and it's normal, it's log normal. Um, I, I haven't done any stats on this or anything, but I, I would bet that this is the most common assumption for a distribution used for strictly positive um, outcomes in fisheries and probably ecology and a lot of other fields. Uh, it's pretty pretty natural choice. And um, used in a lot of different ways, but specifically today we're going to talk about two kind of broad areas. The first is um, index standardizations, which are just regressions, including spatial glims like VAST or SDM-TMB. Um, and so that's the observation likelihood component of your like, hall level data. Um, you need to assume what that is. And then the second big topic today is um, stock assessment, fishery stock assessments, the indices of abundance. Um, and where that's typically also, although there are some caveats. So with synthesis, SS3. Uh, it does have a T distribution option. I've never heard of that being used, but um, presumably Rick probably knows some cases when it was. I don't think that's widely used. Um, and in VAST, um, there's a bunch of options um, like gamma, inverse gamma, inverse Gaussian, um, Tweedy. Um, there are some other ones, but I, I would I think it's fair to say that predominantly log normal is uh, the most most common one. So we're going to talk about that a lot today. So um, I think 
I think we always want to challenge our statistical assumptions when we're doing modeling, right? And I think that's something that's not been done enough. And the first kind of this time this came up for me at least was when um, a group of us led by Jim Thorson, uh, these are I think basically all Alaska Center people, um, looking at VAST and comparing like design-based and index-based methods and finding there's actually the, in the model-based ones, the VAST results were pretty sensitive to what distribution you assumed for your observation error. Um, kind of spawned off this whole study, and we found that a couple of key points. Um, one, that the gamma generally performs better. The Tweedy did well as, did well also, but for strictly positive, the gamma performed quite well. In other words, there's some statistical evidence that log normal is not the best one to use. Um, and the other one is that the scale changed a lot. So in other words, the, your results mattered. It's not some kind of simple little thing that we can ignore. Yeah. When you say it performed better, does that mean like better in some sort of AIC like thing? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so it had a um, the gamma had better AIC values for a lot of cases, and then like a cross simulation study where if you simulate from a log normal and and fit, like the gamma can can do well when data are a variety of tr true underlying distributions. It's, it's kind of a safe distribution to use. If you're estimating catchability on the index, does the scale matter that much? Uh, it doesn't. But we at Alaska Center often have priors or estimate Q, so it does matter. But yeah, very astute point, Kiva. Um, so that's in the index. So I think there's cause to question whether we should just blindly use the log normal in an index. Um, I think the same for standardization, excuse me, the same goes for um, an index of abundance, right? So we take that and we stick it into a stock assessment as a piece of data. It tells us about a trend over time given by these points with confidence intervals. This is from uh, Alaska stock. Um, you know, and often it's said that that's probably the most important data set that goes into an assessment, right? We should get the trend right. Um, there's kind of a whole literature on data weighting. Um, and these indices can, ar can arise from either design or model-based estimators. Megzi's gonna go into this in quite a bit of detail. For now, I just wanna make the claim that, you know, inside these methods, both of these things are summing positive, strictly positive quantities. So this equation here, this I here is what VAST is doing. Um, so basically we're taking an area for some site, spatial site S, multiplying it by the density there, and that gives us biomass. And then you sum all the biomasses up to get total biomass, which we call for the whole area for a year, which is what we call the index. So this idea that we're summing positive things. Um, so it should be log normal, right? We know, so that's the, the big question. and. So I usually don't like to do this like reveal thing in talks, but I do, I do want people to think about it for a, a couple seconds here. So on the left, where I have a little simulation experiment where I have four normal distributions in log space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a random draw from each one. I'm going to exponentiate each. Should I be using my mouse for the people online that can't see it anyway? Um, so I'm going to exponentiate each of those, sum them together, and then log them. This is what we're doing when we um, are calculating our vast index or design based index. So the question is, is Y normal? So I've logged it. So is it going to be normal? Behind this white thing, I have QQ plots. So I want you to think about the difference. So in the top panel, um, you know, different means, different CVs, obviously. The middle panel compared to the middle panel. And then the third panel is just the middle panel. I've just shifted the means up. So is that going to affect the distribution of Y when I do that? So just think about it for a sec. And the answer is that the bottom two are very, very close to log normal. And the top one is wildly not. And the point I want to make about this is that sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. Um, and it's hard to predict. It depends on the combinations of the means and the CVs. So there's kind of this abstract space of means and CVs when you have the summation of these um, random variables, and that dictates the distribution. This distribution has no known analytical PDF. It is absolutely not a normal, a log normal distribution. There's a whole literature on that. I've given a couple. Um, th th these papers look at kind of like special cases, but there's no general solution to what happens when you log a bunch of, you sum log normals, basically. So we make this assumption wildly, and there's really no statistical justification for it in many cases. So just to summarize, before I turn it over to Jason, um, you know, it's, it's really commonly assumed, no theoretical justification. I, our point today is we need to pay more attention to this assumption. 
just like we do for other statistical assumptions and models. Um, and what our goals are kind of broadly the, for our group is we want to know how common is non-log non normality. We want a distribution that's more flexible that we can fit um, and then test for it and its implications on index standardization and on stock assessment. So that's where this new generalized gamma distribution comes in. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Jason here to walk through the details. And please interrupt if you have questions while we're done. Thanks, Cole. Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, so Jim Thorson pulled me into uh, this cesspool of <laughs> uh, working with this new distribution, and um, I, I found it to be really cool. Um, so over here, um, the, the figure we have is kind of a, a, a hierarchy of distributions and resources at this link at the bottom. Uh, Kirk's 2019. It's a really useful resource. Um, and we're going to start uh, the history of the generalized gamma distribution at the Amoroso distribution, um, which is a four parameter uh, distribution, uh, two, um, two scale parameters, I think, uh, and a location parameter. And um, that's the one in the middle. Sorry. That's the one in the middle. Yeah, that's right over here. Um, I haven't presented in person in a long time. So. <laughs> uh, how do we how do we even do this? Um, so uh, that was developed uh, a long time ago. The uh, all the the sources are in the uh, the citations at the end of the presentation for anybody who's interested. But Stacy took the Amoroso distribution, took away the location parameter, um, and uh, so now it's a, a three parameter distribution. Um, and that became the, the generalized generalized gamma distribution. Uh, within it are still the, the useful um, cases of uh, normal, log normal, and gamma. So within Amoroso and uh, within the generalized gamma below the Amoroso, we still have access basically to, uh, to the, those primary distributions and, and others. There's uh, Weibull is uh, a special case as well. Um, so that's great. I mean, we have uh, adding one parameter to our, our usual two parameter distributions in log normal gamma. Uh, we are able to have the flexibility of, of either of those, uh, which we'll see later uh, in the analyses that, that Megzi does is really important. Um, uh, however, in the, the parameterization that Stacy presented, uh, uh, did not lend itself to uh, maximum likelihood. So Prentice reparameterized um, and did uh, a couple of uh, a couple of transformations in the Stacy um, PDF and was able to um, make it an a evaluatable um, equation um, for computing in in that period. Uh, however, uh, it's numerically unstable as the uh, the family parameter, which we're calling Q. Uh, uh, approaches zero. So I think the closest I was get to uh, able to get to zero in the VAS implementation was like 0.02, uh, and and then it, it wouldn't resolve. Um, and that's for the one. Can you give me just briefly why you picked the evaluated distribution? Uh, yeah. Uh, no. It <laughs> it has to do with uh, the number of digits, uh, uh, decimal points that the um, uh, that the computer can can hold in in memory. I think. It'll be more apparent on when you show the. Okay, okay. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, Lawless and Cox further reparameterized, um, which, uh, which makes it, uh, I think, uh, a valuable uh, at, at all values. Um, uh, and they added uh, some testing. But uh, we're going to focus on Prentice for, for VAST because that's kind of the most parsimonious <laughs> um, implementation of the, the PDF. Um, and so this is the PDF that's used in VAST. It's also the PDF that's used in the package FlexServe. Uh, and I'll cover the, the various implementations uh, in, a, in a later slide. Um, so yeah, you can see uh, as, uh, as Q goes to zero, <laughs> uh, a, a bunch of things just fall out <laughs> of the equation. Uh, so it, it, uh, it becomes unstable. But um, is it even differentiable? 
that not true value sign? That is not true value sign. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think one other thing is, um, no, I can't remember the other thing. <laughs> um, anyway, the, oh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, on the next, does anybody want to spend time looking at, <laughs> at this equation? No, okay. Well, it's natural. What are the parameters? Uh, okay, uh, Q is the sure. Q is the uh, Q is the family parameter. Sigma is the dispersion parameter, and then uh, there in the various parameterizations, um, there's uh, well in the parameterization that we're looking at, uh, we're using uh, mean. So the yeah, mu sigma and q are are the are the parameters. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a gamma distributed variable. In the PDF. Yes. Mu sigma and q. Wait, so PDF is a random quantity. Yeah, that's exactly why I'm yeah, uh, I would say if you have deeper questions, then then <laughs> then this uh, send uh, Thorson an email. <laughs> He's also online. Okay, yeah, Jim, do you want to speak up and? I mean, it's mean variance and Q. That's, right. That's what we're going to see about this slide. But I guess is this is the PDF random? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that gamma is probably just used in. Oh, there's not. Like, there's no. It's a gamma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a gamma email. It's just. <laughs> okay. <Special treat>. Moving, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Easter egg. Um, and so uh, here are the 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 uh, expressions of mean and variance uh, in this parameterization. Uh, and what I wanted to mention also was that uh, for the generalized gamma, CV is expressed in terms of uh, sigma and Q. So it's independent of um, uh, of the the mean parameter. Uh, which is interesting, coming from a uh, fisheries survey <laughs> um, practitioner point of view. Um, and then the special cases for uh, the gamma distribution are when Q equals sigma and uh, for log normal when Q uh, approaches or is equal to, to zero. You'll see in the, uh, in the FlexServe package uh, in the code, it's actually a, an if statement. If uh, if Q equals zero, uh, then they just they just feed back the the PDF for log normal. Uh, otherwise, it feeds into the, the same PDF that uh, that I uh, had on the previous slide. Um, and so this is a a, a nice uh, picture that, that Cole came up with of uh, varying Q with the same mu and sigma. Uh, and this is using the the FlexServe uh, package. Uh, it's also been implemented in G gamma and uh, gamless, but I haven't, uh, I don't think any of us have played around with those, those packages. There's really no need to because uh, FlexServe kind of takes, takes care of all of that. It's available in Python and in SciPy if, if you want it. And, uh, and Jim has recently included it in VAST. It's available in the, the main branch um, of, uh, of VAST. Could you point to the line that says which I can't? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see, uh, this one is, uh, is uh, Q is negative two, then Q is negative one, Q equals zero is here, and uh, that's log normal, and Q equals sigma is this one second to, second to last, and then Q equals one. Is that clear enough, is, is waving at the screen? Yeah, is there a version that goes to normal? Um, I can't remember. Uh, I think I think that there is. I think I remember reading in, in one of the resources <laughs> that uh, that normal is the only symmetric distribution um, included in special cases for um, for gen gamma. As the mu gets larger, the log normal goes to normal distribution. Oh, that's yeah. Um, yeah. 
Okay, and uh, in, in addition to this, uh, we'll see uh, Cole will present um, implementation in uh, uh, ways to implement in TMB and ADMMB. Yeah, and I think just one comment on the slide, like the, the point is as Q gets more and more negative, we get a really long, longer and longer right tail. Of right. I'll show a clearer picture of like what that looks like. Okay, so uh, moving on to practical applications, all of this is is pretty preliminary. I'm I'm working on uh, the beginning of the paper with uh, with Jim. Uh, so it's already available in Vast, but it's it's undocumented and unstudied. So our recommendation is that uh, feel free to play around with the generalized gamma in Vast, but um, I wouldn't publish anything on it until until uh, this paper is is published and has been peer reviewed. So. Um, we're, we're confident in, uh, we, we know that we can use it. We don't really uh, know what it means to use it so far. Um, and the simple changes you make in VAST is in the observation model uh, for positive catches, uh, you switch it to nine. Uh, and usually uh, for the uh, elastin stock assessments that, that use VAST estimates of, of the survey index, uh, we've been using gamma for the past several years. Um, and I, I don't, we, ha we haven't talked to anybody who's who's done that. Yeah, Jim? Yeah, I just wondered for that, does it do the set of uh, estimated parameters and generalized gamma by year, or is it one? It's one. One set for the Well, uh, the, the mu's, the mu's are, are by year, but the, the sigma and family parameter are uh, just one. Well, for the whole time series so far. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, that's on a, a later slide of, of things to look forward to. Uh, and so here are some very preliminary results. Um, I uh, did a bunch of species and, and tried to find things with uh, varying Q and, and sigmas. Um, and so uh, walleye pollock, we have uh, uh, we have three species here, walleye pollock in the eastern Bering Sea shelf, and then two gulf species, uh, POP and spiny dogfish. Uh, and then uh, we just uh, ran everything through VAST, keeping everything the same except for uh, that observation model um, for positive catches. Uh, so we have gamma, log normal, and then generalized gamma for each species. Uh, and so for walleye pollock, uh, the AIC for gamma and generalized gamma were identical. Um, uh, at least within the precision of <laughs> um, uh, uh, of this table, and uh, the the family that's the uh, this is Q closest uh, closest to zero, which I don't have an explanation yet for why uh, Q close to zero isn't more. Uh, comparable to the log normal and the gamma, but that's, uh, that's how it, it uh, landed. Um, and then we have uh, POP here where uh, log normal is selected uh, in, uh, by AIC, but generalized gamma is 1.95 behind. It's, it's, not that, it's not that far behind given that it's three parameters versus two. Um, and then spiny dogfish uh, is the closest we have to what we would expect to be a, a gamma distribution in that uh, sigma and Q are uh, approximately equal. Um, they approach each other anyway. And uh, here we see, again, with the AIC, uh, I'm, I'm not sure really how to interpret that quite yet. Uh, but it did select for the generalized gamma. Um, and then log normal is, is uh, a, a close second. Um, and then just plotting the indexes, you know, the indices, um, here we just see the, the, the flexibility of the generalized gamma. So, um, so for Pollock, we have uh, the, the generalized gamma follows almost identically uh, the gamma distribution uh, for, the, uh, for the point estimate. And log normal bounces up, up above it. For POP, we have uh, the generalized gamma following closely um, to the, the log normal. Uh, distribution and the gamma distribution is again far away. And then in uh, dogfish, we have the generalized gamma at different points following closely either to 
generalize uh, either to the, the gamma or the log normal. Um, so uh, right here, the generalized gamma is uh, is tracking log normal, and then as we get uh, over here, it starts tracking uh, the, the gamma distribution. So the the take home point there is that it's just it's just pretty flexible. Jim, did you? In case somebody's paying attention, that twenty twenty value for pollock is not really zero. Is that correct? Right. <laughs> yes, it's not really zero. <laughs> uh, no, still <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, as I said, uh, everything I'm presenting is very preliminary. <laughs> um, and for the purposes of, of chatting only. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Uh, no, the uh, dogfish is uh, is pretty patchy, um, and uh, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of zeros basically uh, in in the Gulf, uh, and uh, POP is uh, uh, well fairly fairly ubiquitous, but right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these three species represent you know really different life histories um, and distributions. Uh, spatial and statistical. Um, I think the comment that if the indices vary that much by just changing the likelihood, yeah, I'm disturbed <laughs> our ability to track the bonus over time. Uh, yeah. So uh, the the next step in in the, the paper figure is to uh, to plot the standard errors and, okay. and to see what we're what scales we're looking those at. Are, those are like up to a constant of like mm -hmm. polyps, more or less. Yeah, the scales are are, are vastly different. Um, right, but yeah. up, up to a constant. Like you're tracking the trends. The trends are different. Yeah, when you use those in the model, you would then have a set of Q that just all comes out to wash. Yeah. That's only the trend that matters. Yep. So so does that mean here, if you plotted these relative to the mean or something, would they look, would they go talk to each other? I think that's what we're not. And that doesn't good. always happen, but I think it's probably true in this case. But yeah, the whole thing, like, what, what I'm trying to get is, does that matter? Does it matter that one is twice the size of the other? Does that really mean they're twice as many pollock, or is it, or they're actually just the same, just scale with a different cube? Yeah, I think it matters. I mean, we're, there's a whole paper on the surprising sensitivity of that choice. And it's, it's a lingering problem, I would say. Um, I, so, so I guess my follow up is that if instead of using VAST, if you use like a design based survey estimate, would it matter that what likely you to? Or is that not really a definable? That's not really. Maybe you will tell us all about it. I will tell you all about it. <laughs> <So far. laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it is the case that we've seen a lot of these, and the, the gamma is much closer to design based than the log normal one. Are you sure that? Because that was kind of surprising. Well, I mean, not mm -hmm. kind of surprising. There was a pattern that we saw for all the different stars. Yeah, I think we have it for one star. We get just log normal. I mean, we're sure the estimate of Q over time for. <laughs> so I'm aware I'm taking too much time because we run out of time. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll hand it off to Megzi. Yay. Okay. So, as Cole mentioned, he and I were talking about this assumption of log normality in, from stock assessments, and we wanted to test this assumption for the stocks that we have a bunch of data for. Um, we focused on the Gulf of Alaska. This is the survey area is outlined in red on this map. Uh, and this is the survey that I take part in. So this is me physically on the survey. Um, there's about 500 stations across the whole survey region and they're stratified uh, by depth and terrain and region, which is roughly uh, uh, longitude. And um, we, so we go to these 500 stations, we collect a bunch of data, and this is the data that goes into the, the stock assessment, the products that we provide the stock assessment authors. So we pulled out a set of species that we thought 
They, they are covering a range of life histories. We've got some flatfish, some rockfish, and some, these are like, people call these round fish, but it's not really a category they're gadgets. Anyways, uh, and so, you know, after we collect all of this data on these species, they get turned into indices of abundance, which I'll cover in the next slide. And then those go, go into the stock assessment and then a bunch of other stuff happens. Um, and for, I'll get to it. I'll talk about it on the next slide. Um, yes. Oh, also I'm gonna try something. Sorry, it's just bothering me. No, oh, well, I tried. Okay. Uh, so for each of these nine species that we listed on the previous slide, we have both design-based and model-based indices of abundance for them. And I don't know, I, I think this is kind of like common fisheries terminology for some people, but for me, it was not when I started this position at the Alaska Center, so I'm going to review it. Um, the design-based index is based on this stratified sampling design. And in when you're calculating a design-based index, you're essentially taking an area-weighted mean um, across the, the strata that you have in the survey. So we have um, like 60, 59 strata, I think, in total. Um, and when we make the design-based calculation, we're calculating a biomass by stratum, and then we're summing them together to get the total. Um, and model-based indices involve using a species distribution model to, to predict densities across the entire survey area, and then summing the predictions to get your index of abundance. So that's sort of the difference between these two approaches. This is like a little bit of a janky figure. We're not directly comparing like, this is not like the real shape of like what comes out of VAST. Um, but in general, like this is like the theory behind it. We have spatial predictions and we sum them. Um, and you know, you can use all kinds of species distribution models to do this. We use VAST, which is a spatial glim, but you can also use, people use things like GAMS and stuff in other places. Um, but that's the difference between the two types of indices. And we have both indices for all the stocks that I listed on the last slide. Um, so we wanted to see if the data had the distribution that we thought it did. And we don't know the true distribution of, of the biomass data in the Gulf of Alaska. Like if we did, I would be out of a job probably. Um, but um, we can sort of approximate it by bootstrapping. So what I did was take the full data set for each year and each species and resample at the stratum level with replacement. So you get essentially like a, a table of all the halls for that year and species, um, like a, a, a randomized hall table. Um, from that, you can calculate the total biomass index and get this sort of distribution of the total biomass estimates and compare it to a log normal distribution. So we just wanted to see, you know, how log normal are these uh, design-based indices. Um, and we did the same thing, or I guess, I don't know. Cole, did you do it or did I do it? Cole wrote the function and I ran it. Uh, so we also did a similar approach for, for the, the model-based indices um, in using the, using VAST. So VAST estimates those biomass B and then it uses the delta method to get a standard deviation. And we assume that B is log normal, um, but we don't actually know the real distribution of B, like I mentioned before. Um, when you're using VAST, each of these fits can take a really long time. So bootstrapping the data themselves is not feasible. Um, posterior sampling with MCMC, also too slow. Uh, but I will, sh I will now show you a, uh, pseudo, I would call it a pseudo bootstrap. Um, and I think part of what the input that we would love today is like, what do you think about this? Um, and I'll show you how it works. Bootstrap. What's that? I think it's called a parametric bootstrap. Is that the third one? Yeah. Oh. You, like, you make an assumption about a parametric, right, parametric to make an assumption that the MLE will be very normal. But then you simulate data. Yeah. Yeah. We're not doing that. Yeah. Okay, so this is what it looks like in VAST. When you fit a VAST model, you get a, a giant object, and part of that object is this thing called OBJ, which is the TMB part of the model. Um, 
and from that you can get the joint precision matrix and sample uh, sample from that joint parameter space and assume this that they're multivariate normally distributed um, with the mean that you from with the the best fit mean and then a precision that you're drawing randomly. Um, and then from that, you can calculate the index, the total biomass index in each year. So it's kind of a bootstrap and kind of not. Um, so Cole will explain how he did this in TMB in a couple slides from now, but we, we got these distributions for all the model-based estimates as well. So we have design-based and model-based bootstrap distributions. Um, and we fitted log normal and generalized gamma to all of them. And this is just sort of like an example to show how different they can look from year to year. So this is, I think this is for Pollock, yeah? So this is for Goa Pollock and you can see like what the difference in the fits from year to year. Like sometimes Q is really negative and that means there's a really long tail to the right. And sometimes it like when Q is zero and it looks perfect and it's perfectly log normal. So that's on the X axis. Oh. In this case, it would be like millions of metric tons. Yeah. Bottoms. Sorry. And this is run through fast, or is this? This is design based. Right. Oh, this is design based. Yeah. So this is oh. separate from the previous slide. Oops. Yeah. Well, it's just an example, though. Yeah. The procedure is the same. And and you'll see in a couple of slides also both of them side by side, so you can compare them. Um. So this might be a little bit hard to see, but this is the for Pollock. This is what the um, QQ plots look like for both of those bootstrap exercises. So um, the design-based index is in yellow and the blue is vast. And you can see like what they look like every year and how different the sort of normality of it changes over time. Um, so sometimes you have really big tails and sometimes you don't. Um, we don't have both indices for every single year in this particular example because this was our first like I don't remember why we left those years out, but they, they exist for those years. They're just not in here. Um, and probably an easier way of like making this comparison is that you can estimate, you know, you look at the estimated cues over time. So if the Q, the estimate of Q is close to zero, then it's more log normal. Um, this is still uh, Pollock over time. So the different indices are different colors and there is, a lot of evidence for non-log normality over time. We just have like a couple years um, where it looks really log normal. So we had a lot of questions about like why, like why would it be so different between years? We sort of expected that the biggest differences would be between species and not between years. Um, so this is what it looks like when you put all of the, um, each point here is year. So if you put all the all the years together and look at them across species, um, there are some that like seem to have kind of a clear pattern, but then, um, I mean, look how wide the range is for Pollock. Like it's just changing a lot over the years that we have indices for. Um, so we have some like ideas about why they might be behaving that way, but it doesn't seem super strongly linked to like the ecology of the fish or like, you know, any of our sort of hypothesized differences. Trevor. Um, so so Q, Q equals zero is log normal. Q equals sigma is gamma. Is this is that sigma like the sigma in the log normal? So it's like a CB. So like 0.2, 0.3, 0.4. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So, the, so on this plot, if we're looking for things that look like gamma, how would we know what looks like gamma? Uh, only apply to things greater than Q greater than zero. And we have to just look at the estimated parameter. Oh, Q greater than zero. Okay, so less, all right, less than zero is. Yeah. So it's like more log normal than log normal. Big, big well, tail, big tail, mostly. big tails on the left, like right tail. The gamma's like not as doesn't have a lot of tail. Yeah, you can't tell by looking at the plot. It's just like, yeah, but it's going to be rare. So, it, like, if we were to use this generalized gamma distribution, you would never be able to estimate a different Q across years, right? If you're using a model-based index 
or if you're using it as the distribution consumption for the stuff. Okay, right? I'm going to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm going to, I'll talk about the different species on the next slide. So this is what it looks like for the model-based indices, that same plot. Um, and yeah, we had these ideas when we started this project, we were thinking like there's some species that we know are probably less perfectly captured by this bottom trawl survey. Like we include a lot of rockfish in the survey, but the but the survey is taking place on like soft, smooth bottoms adjacent to rocks. So like we sort of expected, okay, maybe because of the life history of some of these species, they will be like, they will have, they will, you know, be better suited to the generalized gamma because they'll have these like long tails because we don't know the higher, you know, we don't know if there is actually a true like higher abundance value. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and we, don't have any like cool, smart things to say about it. We just wanted to show you what it looks like. Um, but there's a lot of variation between species and you know, in the design-based index, there's a lot of variation between years. Okay, now Cole is gonna explain what all this means. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Cole, you do that one. So I promised in the abstract, I promised we'd present stable ADMB and TV code. These are like maybe stable. This is definitely still like in research. Um, and so, yeah, left TMB, right uh, ADMB. And um, it's just that PDF coded up. Um, the, the things to point out are the things in red. So there's an absolute value in the PDF, which is not technically differentiable. Um, a hack that you can do is to square Q and then take the square root. Um, and that kind of works. Um, the bigger problem is when we have Q close to zero, you know, we're, we're getting close to um, you know, one over zero. So this thing will definitely blow up. Both of these will blow up if Q is near zero. So that's kind of our biggest problem with it at the moment. I would say in practice, they both seem to work pretty well in general. Like I, I was getting some um, some estimates of Q that were you know, pretty close to zero, that's, that were sensible and even had standard errors. Some that were like close to zero without standard errors, I was getting the NAN. So it's definitely gonna break around zero. Um, so we need to kind of sort that out. Um, um, but you always could rerun it as log normal, right? If, if, you, if Q wanted to go to zero and it was breaking, you could do that. Um, so yeah, let's move on. Uh, no, hat tip. Because I'm awful, awful, awful at ADMB coding, so. Yeah, so the question is, you know, how can you actually test for normality, log normality? I would say, like, you, you, so we have estimates of Q that are really close to zero that have yeah. uncertainty around them. This comes out of TMB. Um, and I would say anything probably where the confidence interval is covering zero is, yeah, is approximately log like normal. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I don't trust anything when Q is close to zero, but I think it's clear that the model, there's a signal in the model, in the data, and the model will try to get to zero. And if it starts to misbehave, it's log normal, and you can just use log normal. Okay. It's certainly the tricky part of this PDF yes. is but when Q is zero. I think it would be interesting to have a look at the confidence intervals around Q uh, without making these Gaussian approximations. So simulation yeah. Uh, yeah yeah that's exactly the kind of things we need to explore still but uh, i think i'm you know having played with it in both tmb and admb i'm pretty convinced that it does work and it's pretty reliable and it's really clear when it doesn't work um so that's good but yeah certainly preliminary um so thinking now about so jason kind of showed results for the index the estimation index itself, now talking about putting it into the stock assessment. So my proposal is you take basically the estimates on that previous slide. So I get a mean, a variance, and a Q for each year for my 
from my species, from the bootstrap samples, whether that's from a design base or a model base, um, I can I can fit that just with TMB, you just read those samples in. Um, so I get estimates of those three, read those into ADMB as known values. That's something I didn't cover here, but this is coded where the print, look at the parameters are, are doubles. Um, so those are not being estimated, right? We're assuming those are true. What's being, what's, what's the D variable is our prediction X, that's a predicted biomass. Um, so just read it in and, um, you know, run a model with and one without. So that's what I've done here for the, the Pollock assessment in the Gulf. So the red is the general light gamma, the blue is the log normal. Um, you know, it has a pretty large, I think a pretty large effect on the assessment, you know, maybe 10% bigger spawning biomass, the CV is a little bit bigger. And if you think about the intuition, when Q is negative, right, and we assume log normal, we're artificially inserting information into the likelihood, right? If the, if the data says, well, it might be this high and the log normal says, no, it can't ever be that high or that's 10 standard deviations away. We're, by using the generalized gamma, we're reducing the information in the index. And so it makes sense that the CD is gonna be bigger. So this fits with that really tight fire on the other Q in your assessment model? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, so if you loosen that up, do you still get some differences? I, I haven't tried that, but... Um, yeah, it would, that would interact for sure. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to dwell too much in this particular case. It's just to say that, you know, the log normal assumption is pretty strong. And if it's not right, it can have a pretty big impact on our assessments. Okay, Jason, so that, that's it for the assessment. We're going to start wrapping up here. Yeah, uh, just a one slide wrap up for me. <laughs> Uh, looking at the uh, the survey estimates <clears throat> or uh, index standardization, um, I, again, I, I think it's it's pretty cool that we can add one uh, extra parameter and um, uh, compared to our our other distributions and uh, gain the the dexterity uh, to um, uh, to model all of the, all of the distributions that we're traditionally uh, have been using or have been trying at least in the past. Um, and that the complexity of the model is offset uh, by the gains uh, in the fit, uh, based purely on AIC. Uh, we haven't looked at any other diagnostics, and so that's an area for uh, further research. Uh, it's not computationally burdensome. It doesn't take, uh, in VAST, it doesn't take much longer at all um, than gamma. Um, it, it takes longer than log normal, uh, because log, log normal is pretty quick. Um, and then, uh, again, as Cole mentioned, uh, if uh, if you're using using the vast Im implementation and Q is is getting close to zero, or you're just getting um, um, uh, maximizing errors um, uh, or, or failing failures when the model is being tested, first you can uh, turn check fit off in uh, in the vast fit and get all the way to the end. And then if Q is uh, going to zero, uh, you can go back to uh, the log normal distribution, uh, easy peasy. Thanks, Jason. So yeah, think about implications for stock assessment. Um, what do I have here? You know, just thinking about what this Q is actually doing. So when Q moves away from zero, it's changing the leverage of a data point, right? It's changing, if you think about that index figure, it's changing the confidence interval. It's changing the leverage on both the high and the low side. And thus it's affecting the statistical weight that's given to that particular data point and that data series in general. Um, and my point is like, I think we should get the likelihood right. And I think the log normal is not right probably most of the time. So that's my big takeaway from kind of experimenting with this. In fact, I think the burden should be on people when you assume a log normal is you need to justify that or be clear that that it's quite a strong assumption. That's my personal opinion. I will say both the bootstrap, bootstrap approaches are, are quite straightforward and pretty easy to do and easy to include in the assessments. So I really think there's no reason for us not as a field to try this more and experiment with it and see how well it works and when it works well, et cetera. Um, and when will this matter for our assessments? I think my intuition is that when Q is less than zero and our large residuals is more, when we're gonna see the largest differences. Um, and that's certainly true for the, the Pollock example I gave, but we you know, we need to do that. Another, another instance is if you have a conflicting indices, um, it's gonna be sensitive to that, I believe as well, if your Qs are, 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 are negative. Um, and that's also gonna interact with data weighting, right? 
So if I, anyway, yeah, I, we need to, we should get going. Um, yeah, so discussion points and future work. Um, I think we've provided pretty, pretty solid evidence that Q is less than zero a lot, both for hall level data that go into VAST and for the index that comes out of estimators, design and model based estimators. I don't know if you guys are convinced, I'm curious. Um, are people convinced? Jim? I, I'm convinced it's worthwhile. I'm less convinced about the vast approach because I don't fully understand how you get annual cues from something that's assuming constant cues. If I understand how vast was implemented, because the answer to the question that doesn't vary over time is something new. But if sigma, the output of sigma varies from a vast model, I guess I'm trying to remember the equation in the beginning how that would interact. How are you getting the annual cues? Yeah. Like a variant normal? Uh, from vast? From vast. Yeah. I get the bootstrap sign. I don't get that. How do you do it? In well, if so, say I had MCMC draws from vast, I could put each draw in and I could calculate the index for each year. Repeat however many draws I have, and I have to have a posterior distribution of the index. That's what I'm using. The way what, what we're doing here is essentially an approximation to doing that. So, but that's the idea. So wait, so the, the, the cue that you put into the assessment is different than the cue that VAST spits right. out. You could have calculated that cue based on a VAST, like a, a log normal against the VAST model. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah, so there's two. Yeah. What, we're, it's, it's kind of weird, but we're proposing it's you use really you use the GGD for the data likelihood in VAST, and then you use it again for the distribution of the index as a, as a product that goes into the assessment. Right. Because yeah. the, the likelihood of the index index is completely different than like, the hall level likelihood. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Jim has oh, Can Jim I? Has yeah. yeah no, no, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was going to say, I mean, there's sort of two different ways of using VAST that are sort of demonstrated here you know one of them is interpreting the q estimate as a hyperparameter and then the other one is doing this sort of sampling from the joint precision and backing out the you know approximating the q that would come out of that sampling distribution and um i think that's the confusion here um you know it is possible to estimate an annual variation in q in vast by using the um the interface that's available with this index e sub i that's passed and you know cole and jason or whoever if we're interested we could go back to that that'd be that'd be an interesting test is whether the you know estimating an annually varying q as a hyperparameter matches the annual variation in the q that approximates the sample based uh okay. calculation that The bubble plots for the vast and the mm -hmm. design days. Yeah. They had very similar patterns. They're yeah, they're actually not co correlated. Oh, wow. Which I, I don't think we I, we made a figure, they're not that correlated. Um I'm curious where this sits on your spectrum of oh crap, my assessment's totally wrong. So let's look at my screen. Other things like I don't know your prior on Q that you might have been. Yeah. I think where do you put this in your prioritization for trying future assessment, right? When personally, and then maybe more writ large. Um, I, I think it should be high because I think it's easy to, enough to do, and I think we should use the right. We should. We need to transfer the right information from the data into our assessment, and I think if you assume a log normal, you're not always doing that. You know these this these people go out and spend so much time on the survey, so much effort, you know, and we just make this kind of blase assumption. It's like, well, there's a lot of richness of information in that data. And I think we can, we can tease that out and then put that into the assessment. And I think that makes for better assessments. So I think that's a higher priority. Whereas like, you know, arguing about, you know, the prior on Q is like, I don't know how to do that. I know how to do this. And I think it's better statistically and so it's a high priority for me. And I, I, I guess that's what I'm proposing as we as a field start thinking about doing this more. I mean, we argue about the stupid comp likelihoods, you know, 
I mean, there's 20 papers on how to get the distribution right for the composition data, and there's zero on the, the piece of data that matters the most. So I'm not saying this is the end solution. I'm saying it's a step forward and it's a field we should probably think about it in our analyses. Um, so um, I don't know. I think the really the cool thing about this that we're going to get to next is like what causes Q? Can we try to tease that out? We have all these, um, we're like totally out of time, but um, we have all these hypotheses. I guess I would say, well, we'll go back to this, maybe just broadly to the group. Do people buy that those bootstrap procedures are doing what we think? I think I'm kind of skeptical of each one individually, but they tend to corroborate each other. And so that makes me feel more confident in them. So are there any like vehement opposition to either of those approaches? I don't know, okay. Can you compare that to the pure, to a pure database bootstrap? So you if we just bootstrap well, the database and have a class, which then would make model based something happen. For the vast one, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So if we had infinite computing power, we would probably we would bootstrap the data similar to what we did with design based, or we'd run MCMC and we'd get you know the true true samples from the joint posterior. And we could do that, I think, in isolation to, for some specific cases to test test that, but um I don't think it's a fee either one's a feasible I'm kind of production. It depends on the species and the model, but some of them take like weeks. Uh, I mean, the, the, the production. Yeah. Um, yeah, we wouldn't have to. Anyway, we wouldn't have, have to have do. Hours to, uh, I, I think we could pick a model and, and do a thousand data bootstraps for a couple species, probably. While we're on the survey. Yeah, or something, yeah. you know. But I think like <laughs> production-wise, I think that's <laughs> tricky to do. <laughs> Yeah, Cole. Yeah, Jim. I, I was just going to chime in on the, the joint precision sampling. I mean, you know, like I use parametric bootstrap for like resampling from the data that you're fitting and refitting that. And I don't think it's that either. So I, I just call it joint precision sampling. And, you know, like in the textbook with Casper, you know, we're calling it sort of like a low quality approximation. Like it's, you know, it's the, the, the issue is, you know, if you have skewness of the random effects you know the epsilon bias correction it corrects for skewness in a way this doesn't um you're relatively on good footing on the normality of random effects because that's what you're fitting them as but then the real the real stink stinker is sort of like the you know the fixed effects are probably super skewed and depending on how you parameterize it you get different results um you know it's kind of analogous to like that paper that ian stewart did that some of us were on years ago. Um, anyway, you know, you can get these really bad sample, you know, if you sample from the normal multivariate normal for fixed effects from the outer Hessian, you know, some of the variances, you know, some of the L's go negative, which then flips the sign of the estimated spatial pattern. You just get all these like weird things that are due to that multivariate normal approximation for the fixed effects. So anyway, so there's there's a there's a function called sample variable and fast that has different versions of that sampling process that we could walk through if anybody's interested in the details. Yeah, we also have I have some slides and details on the the map behind that joint precision. Um, I'm not sure anybody cares, but so I mean, Colin, it just seems like at the end of the day, the underlying thing that's making a difference is how the fish are distributed in reality. If they're super patchy versus super evenly distributed, that surely is the thing that is causing these blackness to be different. So can you not go back to first principles and say, like, what if we simulate fish distributed in different ways, and then what few estimates do you get from those? And maybe that's a better way than trying to, like, say we have some data, we're going to resample in different ways, but we don't know what the truth is. Yeah, I think that's part of it, and that's a good idea. Um, Sorry, I think I had some, we had some hypotheses, you know, like, yeah, that's what I mean by fundamental property of fish biology, like how they distribute in space. I think it's more than that, though. I think, I think that's probably part of it. I don't, I think that, I think it's, there's something kind of fundamental about both of the methods that um, cause this because you see differences in species between the two different approaches. It's not like, it's not like POP always has the same cue. 
right? So there, there's, there's interactions, I think, between the method and the data that influence this. My argument is that I, I think the, the point is that the survey data often has a hard time bringing forth information that the stock can't be larger. That's harder to do in principle. That's what this whole, all these negative cues are saying is that it's hard for a survey to really eliminate with confidence of much higher biomass than what's estimated, right? And so I, that makes sense to me. What causes it, I think, is, is going to be pretty tricky to sort out. And I think that's a good idea. We should write that down. We can simulate different properties in like a vast bottle or something and then see how that varies. What Megzi has a figure. I don't know how to sh get it because it's uh -huh. hidden. What's the conscious for a five minute time? Yeah, if anybody needs to leave, that's totally fine. This is basically the end. I should just put up the thanks and um, references for anybody online or within the video. Ian Taylor had a had a comment and he says he sold on this approach, but pragmatically, how do we fit the need to switch distributions if Q equals approximately zero with the Thorson argument in let's simplify stock assessment by replacing tuning algorithms with statistics? Um, that's one question. And then he has a second one that would that extra step only occur in the SBM model and fix the Q or choose log normal in the assessment model? I didn't understand that last one, but the first one, you're talking about synthesis, I can tell. Um, you just read in an extra column that's Q. Because that's not a parameter, we don't have to worry about differentiability. So you could, synthesis could have a, an if statement. If Q is within 0 0.05 of zero, just call the log normal PDF, and that would be incredibly stable and approximately the same. Uh, so I think, I think you know, it, it would be, it's fee very feasible, I think, to make this production ready. And then, Ian, I have to let you unmute yourself if you want to explain the second one. Yeah, the, um, Cole, you answered both questions. Yeah, the second question was really just, is that switching distributions thing, we're not estimating Q within our assessment models, right? We're just, we're just Correct. in the SDM model, and then whatever we get, we put into the assessment model as a fixed quantity. That's correct. I want to be very clear. The only estimate of Q is what Jason was talking about inside of VAST. So VAST was estimating a Q. I was estimating it from the bootstrap samples, but it's the assessment is not estimating Q. That's specified as a known quantity, just like our mean and variance are right now. So it's adding a third parameter because since, not all things are log normally distributed. Since I'm still unmuted, uh, could I ask how I'm going to differentiate this Q? Uh, we're over time. <laughs> Turn the turn the recording off. <laughs> Eli's requesting that we switch back to the reference slide. Yeah, sure, sure. Right. Yeah. Ian, if you wanted to keep going, do you want me to stop recording? No, I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what about the convolutions of these variables? Are they at Q? Or... Convolutions of Q? No, no, not of Q, of um, generalized gamma. Like variables, like log normal. Yes. I. Sorry, Jason. Do you know the answer to that? Maybe. It's so annoying. Thank you. Uh, are there properties where, like, you like if they have the same mean and variance, you can add them or anything like that, and it results in a generalized gamma? Um. I doubt uh, it. The, the most information I think I've read about that aspect is on a wiki page. Uh, it's not Wikipedia, it's uh, wiki, wiki how, wiki how I think. I don't know, but um, I, uh, I can follow up and, and, and send, uh, send the, the links to the, the pages. It's like the generalized gamma is not really well documented in very many places. Uh, so there's uh, a couple of discussions online uh, that are uh, looking at the different parameterizations and some of the different properties uh, of the parameters. Lucci, can uh, I they hear I, that online? I think so. Okay. If, I, I, yeah, maybe I have to Probably, not, almost certainly not. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Ian also had another part. Ian just had asking how to differentiate this cue from captability. Yeah, it's terrible. We'll have to. We should pick a different. Capital Q. It's capitalized, but yeah, for our paper, we'll. Capitalized is actually the different catchability. <laughs> <laughs> and we will. We'll. Yeah. So we'll find a different name. So we call it family. Yeah, the family brand. Capital. 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 I mean, you, you have a more flexible and probability distribution, which better, better fits to the data, but it needs a thing that you estimate one more parameter, Q, which can be tricky to estimate. And possibly you have convergence issues then. So, I mean, there, there will be like some kind of trade off between like flexibility of the distribution and the robustness of it. And so, what's your feeling about like convergence issues? And um, you know, it's not, so we're not fitting Q in the assessment. So I think that that's good. Yeah. We're, it's like a, there's an intermediate step where you take the bootstrap mm -hmm. samples and you fit a model to it. If that's like kind of squirrely, it's not a big deal. It takes a 10th of a second to fit, um, you know, each year. So I think if, if you're having convergence problems, it's pretty easy to deal with it outside of the model. And so I think I, it's a, it's a problem. I wish it didn't exist, but I think it's a very small price to pay. Yeah. For a distribution that better reflects the information but in the survey. Like in the, in the best model. Yeah. Like so, yeah. So if you're having problems with Q, so he he gave an example. You maybe could use a different parameterization, or you just have to restart the model and assume yeah. log normal. Okay. Yeah. I actually didn't get that talk in brief. <laughs> um, the uh, I think the the Wallace PDF, uh, either Wallace or Cox in in the references. Um, has uh, a PDF that I assume is differentiable at, at zero, but um, I didn't go any further than the, than the PDF that, that Jim gave me. Yeah, and we're, we're, I mean, we need to like test these PDFs in, in ADMB and TMB a lot just to make sure that you know they're behaving properly. So it, it's definitely a work in progress, but I, for me, the signal is very clear. You know, there's a vast majority of the queues were less than zero. It's well away from the area where the model is going to have any sort of computational issues. Kiva, can I call you out? Sure. <laughs> sure. Do you believe the data bootstrapping for the design based? I think so, but I don't quite understand it. I think I need to just let it sit down. Like, I, 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 what? Just write it up and I'll tell you. Yeah. 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 Okay, <laughs> internal reviewer, perfect. I'm just going to send, <laughs> send all my papers to you. <laughs> oh. With replacement? With replacement. And it's like grouped by strategy. Or, yeah, it's grouped by stratum. So if you have, you know, you have the same proportion of samples in each stratum in each simulation, yeah. but they're different. Yeah, more questions. Different on there are. Um, I mean, the design based one, I think, is totally fine. Right? That's yeah, that's one I want to ask you about. Because yeah, you just are like bootstrapping a sample driven in stratum. So, so you believe the shape of the distribution that comes out is reflective of the process? I sent an email. I think you should look at it relative to presence absence too. Because yeah. I bet that changes somehow. Why? They're independent. Oh, uh, like you should bootstrap it in like a delta bootstrap, delta model bootstrap sort of thing. Yeah, so that's it. So when she's when we're bootstrapping, if there's a zero, that's you know gets pushed through and resampled and then pushed through into okay. the, the design based assessment. Yeah. So there's zeros. That's how you get so that's how you oh man. What yeah, I was curious how that Q would relate to the proportion of zeros. Oh, what was I going? Oh yeah, so like, so you can see like on this the 99, there's like, you know, it's not smooth because there's finite calls, you know, and then like this one here is like re, it's probably one big call and you happen to resample it 10 extra times or something. But on the other side, there's a bunch of zeros that they resample it from. I, what this figure is kind of interesting because it has a longer Right tail that has a much shorter left tail actually, so it's going to influence on both sides. It could pull the model down or pull pull the model up depending on how well it's fitting. I, so I think what you're bootstrapping, right? Like the mean is the biomass that you get from 
the design based estimator. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily like the mean biomass. True, Correct. Right? Correct. Just yeah. Yeah. Value and we, we compared them to each other as like part of just to check for those gaps, and they're usually close. Very close, yeah. The design model. The design based the design estimator based from the full data set. Okay. I, I, I have two thoughts that I'd like to see. One is the like the correlation between the indices that come out of each different sort of bidding. I guess it's just the same thing if you have up or down. Like that would be nice to see for a bunch of different examples. Yeah. And then it would also be nice to see in the stock assessments um, one that doesn't have a really high prior on you because mm -hmm. it is just the same index that that slot should hopefully be soaked up by estimating the Q. Yeah. I think what we do on the West Coast is we like use the Q float option because it's not even estimated. It's just like, like. It's like the analytical yeah. MLE. It's, yeah. I mean, it's not, there's no variance or anything. It's just like, you don't care what the scale of the index is. So it just, you need the value in there, but it's just going to find the best value to make it work. Yeah. You know, but, but keep in mind though, the Q varies by year the way it Folks, right, so it's not like all yeah. the years will get down weighted okay, or up weighted more. Yeah. yeah, but I'm uh, sorry, my Q, oh, they're not directly linked, right? Because yeah. you might have one year where you have a really negative GGDQ, right? That pulls the try and tries to pull the biomass up, and then the next year it might go to try to pull it the other way. So there's, it's not so interpretable how catchability would be affected by these results. So the bottom line is we need to put it into like. 20 stock assessments and see what happens, which which we're gonna do. Cool. Well, at least all of our all of our bespoke models, we just, synthesis will be tricky to do it in. Anybody want to go to lunch? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Calling it. I'm always up for it. Okay. But distribution off everything. <laughs> okay. Well, should have come first. Right, guys. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. We're just email first. Shout out to the